Well, all right. So um, welcome everybody to our second uh, Fair Trade Explorers meeting. We are excited to have uh, guest speakers here tonight. Uh, uh, I think you all know me. My name is Patrick Lynch. I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator at Just Creations. Uh, I will be running the chat tonight. So if you have anything important that you'd like them to address at the end that you might not remember, that's where it will go. And now I will turn it over to Jenny and Yusuf uh, to tell us. And if you are not muted, go ahead and mute now unless you're speaking like a speaker. Awesome. You're, you're on. All right, I'm on. All right, so let me just make it over here. Spotlight is, all right. Hello, everybody. It is great to be here or to be there, here, uh, or however that is. I, I have to say, I know it's been a really weird year for everybody, but I think it's been really incredible how Zoom has allowed us to connect in new ways, uh, connect in our own places, and yet connect while someone's making pork chops and turnips at the same time. So I am Jenny and- I'm Yusuf. And we are allowed to stand as close to one another without masks on because almost 18 years ago next week, we decided that we didn't not only just enjoy working together, but we proverbially tied the knot. So hence, just so you know, we are appropriately socially distancing since we're in the same household. Yeah. Well, what we're excited to do tonight is we are here uh, at the Bunyad Marketplace in downtown Lidditz, Pennsylvania. It's our new store. Um, we moved in in December after being and sharing space in 10,000 villages for over 38 years. So it's been exciting to be in a new location just 10, uh, 10 minutes away from our old. And it's been overwhelming to figure out how rugs should hang up on our walls, how light should come in, how everything, right? Everything. We, have, this whole time. Yeah. we have new appreciation for fair trade retail stores that um, totally re um, position their store to make room for an annual rug event. And we are super excited to be coming to Just Creation uh, April 7th through 10th for the, uh, which? 7th, 16th. Oh, no, no, 17th. No, 17th, yeah, sorry. 17th annual rug event. Yes. All right, so folks, what we want to do tonight is a couple things. We want to talk to you about who is Bunyad, um, who are the people behind uh, uh, the rugs, who's crafting them in Pakistan. We want to talk to you about some practical things of why do you want to buy a fair trade rug and why is it a win-win situation for all involved? We're going to give you a sneak peek at some of the rugs that are going to be coming your way. Uh, and we're going to be showing you a few little silly videos we put together, both showing you rug production. And we have a special guest tonight who is going to be joining us by a uh, video who's going to talk to you about stain resistancy. So, um, hey, Yusuf, why don't you just like walk on over there and... Uh, take a look at some of the rugs and tell us more about Bunyan. Uh... Well, in 1960s, uh, my father, uh, who, did, who was a rug maker himself, decided that, you know, artisans need to have a fair share of the market. So he made a pledge that he would actually work to make sure that artisan could be working under a safe platform and then a guaranteed fair wage is received by the artisans. Uh, that means that artisans can work from their home. They can create this unique one-of-a-kind piece and guarantee that they have received their money before the rug leaves their home. So this program started back in the 60s with 10 families. Today, there are 850 families that are part of the program, over 125 villages. And with each village, you have artisans who get to create unique rugs. That means from natural dyes, hand spun wool, you know, using natural dyes like this, to collecting uh, ingredients like onion shells, walnut shell, pomegranate shell. So just about every rug is amazing in so many ways. And especially when you're dealing with hand spun wool natural dyes, this is like a lot of labor. But you know, artisans uh, for a long time were walking away from all this natural dye process because it takes a lot of time. So why fair trade has to be there? Well, that means the artisans can live in their own villages and can create rugs from the basic tools, just like they have done for centuries, using you know, tools like this, where you have a comb, a punja that is made within the village. This is a 
a metal to tool that is produced by a family in the village. Uh, tools like this that rug washing happens. Uh, a brush like this that, you know, when you think of rug, these rugs are very, very high quality and they can handle the bristleness of this brush right here. And as a matter of fact, recently I even saw they're starting to use metal brushes because the rugs are designed to be very, very sturdy. And when it comes combined with a fair trade, artisan use tools like this and just simple things like designing, graphing and everything in the villages. That means they get to create each rug to be one of a kind. And fair trade is the main tool among all this. Without fair trade, artisans can't create these beautiful rugs. So since the 60s, this program started, there has been countless number of rugs. But to give you an idea, in 40 years, we just recently had a customer come to us bringing a two by three to be cleaned. That's the first time that rug is getting cleaned. So we're, when we're talking what fair trade does, not only it provides a fair income to a family, not only provides a three meals and education for their children, it also provide a customer with a quality rug that they don't have to worry about how they're gonna you know, live with the rug on a day in, day out. So these are rugs designed to be very high quality and it's all possible because of the fair trade. What that means by when you say fair trade is that artisan can support the education, their living conditions and can make of one of a kind uh, unique rugs. So you've introduced us to the tools use of it. You jumped ahead, man. We got to show them how these rugs are actually, these rugs are made for. So everybody, we're going to show you a quick video about rug making. So this is rug making in two minutes or less. A hand knot punyad rug goes through many hands in many steps. From spinning and dyeing the wool, to designing, painting, and translate the rug design into a written system called talon, allowing the artisans to read the correct amount of knots and colors to tie into a rug. They start by setting up the loom with vertical threads called a warp. Artisans will then work on the rug, putting one knot at a time, creating rugs with hundreds of knots per square inch. One of these rugs can take up to a year and a half to complete. Generally, one artisan will call out the design to everyone working on the loom in an amazing synchronized knotting flow. They would then secure the rope with horizontal threads called weft and pack each row pile with a comb-like tool called the punja. The rug is then cut off the loom and taken for cleaning. First, torch in the back of the rug to get rid of the wool fuzz, and then wash several times with soap and bleach. This process alone will take several days to guarantee a nice, clean rug. During the finishing process, the rug is sheared to its desired length and checked to assure its quality and look. This process includes blocking, stretching and applying neem on the back of the rug, moth-proofing it for life. Once the rug is finished, the fringes are tied to secure the rug. A quality rug can be made anywhere by anyone, but it takes time, quality materials and skilled adult hands. Fair Trade puts all of this together, improving artisans' lives and bringing high-quality crafts to your home. So now, just a question. Is everybody ready to make their own carpet now? You know how. So now I want Yusuf to show, just step away just a little bit from there. Thank you. You look a little bit daunting when you're holding those <laughs> And So what I'd like you to do is now that they know how to make their own carpet, show them the tools that they're going to be used a little bit more up close. So here's the one of the tools that's called panja. You know, this is a tool that is made of wood and steel and basically created by artisans in the village. So there are families who hand, hand create these tools. And, you know, it's, it's a very important tool when it comes to rug making, because without this, 
you can't really uh, set the knots in the quality. And without a good firm hand and a consistency, you're not gonna get the design and the quality in each rug. So it's a very, very important that you have a good tool. And that's another thing that Fairchair guarantees that artisans work with the good tool, good material, and uh, you know, have a work from home rather than working somewhere else. That's the other tool that artisans use, for example, that's the, that's the knife and it's sharp only up to a certain level. And be, again, it's created by hand. Third tool that you need in rug making is the scissors that are designed only to clip certain amount of piles. So it's a very, very uh, perfectly designed tool, but again, within the village. So to me, everything stays within the village. It creates more than one job for, for a family. So it gives a, it has a ripple effect everywhere in the village. And people like to stay in the villages because you know, their livelihood does, uh, have been there for, for centuries. And the idea of leaving their home, their village, because of the economics is more than just daunting because the whole thought of you're leaving your culture behind, you're leaving your traditions behind. And so artisans prefer living in the village and fair trade is a perfect tool to make that happen. And that means the rug making tradition would go beyond you know, the, this century or, the, or uh, the last century. So the whole idea is that fair trade is a perfect tool to create a beautiful rug and something, you know, maybe you can buy these tools and use those to make a rug after watching this video yourself. All right, so they're ready to make. So why don't you give them an idea of design? They don't have a design yet. Yeah. So, oh my goodness, get the design. You didn't tell them which one picked. Design. Yeah, oh, that's right. Oh, well, my goodness. But if you were an artisan, you know. Which they are. They yeah. all are. I mean, so, turnip yeah. and, and yes. red cabbage with pork chops. Who thought You it? can easily think of the colors. You can easily think of the next idea that you want to uh, incorporate into rub. So artisans actually go out in the, in the village, you know, in the fields and stuff. And then basically they, they capture color ideas that they, you know, actually end up using in a rug. So in this this uh, graph, there's so many colors you can see. 15 to 20 is a pretty typical for a Persian style rug, which we'll show you in a few minutes. So this is what you need to bring together and then first draw a graph and then turn into a graph paper like this. So the idea that you have to think through all these things to create one rug possible, it's not that hard, you know, of course you could do, you could learn it very quickly. All right, so they're pretty set. Yep. Now they just need some examples. Yep. So uh, we'll and, show you a few and ideas. Excuse me. This just a moment. We don't believe in child labor. However, when we have a ten-year-old who who belongs in our family, he also is an excellent rug flipper. So let me introduce our excellent rug flipper, Nareis. All right, Nareis, can you guys show them some design so that they can begin to be thinking. Let's raise over to this pile, please. We're gonna go through our Persian eight by 10. And one of the things that we think is really cool, um, as you have said, every single rug uh, is, is unique. Every single design is unique. Um, all these rugs, many of them will be coming to, Nareis, can you say where they're going? They're going Ooh. to Louisville, Kentucky. Very good, nice job. And so if there is anything that you see that looks interesting, holler, say, hey, tell me more about that one. These are all eight by 10. So most of these are over 500 knots per square inch with some of them being our specialty pieces of over 800 knots per square inch. Going to alter the camera there. There we are. How long? Now, I don't know about you. How many of you have young kids that you would like to see Nareis keep flipping through? Nareis, roughly how heavy is each one of these rugs? Ooh, it's a good workout. It's a good workout. So each one of the eight by tens uh, at over 500 knots per square inch, your rug is roughly about 80 to 100 pounds. And about as, uh, yes, about 80 pounds. Nareis had some Benadryl this afternoon, so we're going to see if this helps to work it through. So let's stop on this one, Yusuf. Could you talk a little bit more about some of the colors that are in this one? Because I think it's such 
a testimony. I'm just going to bring you over here, folks. This is the low budget way of moving you over. So to me, that is just such an exquisite color combination. Your purples, your raspberries, your teals, your sea foam. Yeah, so this rug has over 20 colors because uh, it's over 800 knots per square inch, uh, which artisan will spend easily about a, a year or two months. Uh, this is just the tying the notch on the loom. That doesn't include the designing, washing, finishing. So you're looking at about a one year, six month uh, work. But the whole idea is that artisans do bring in these ideas together ahead of time. And that's when they're living in the village, you, you find these colors, these ideas in your head and basically then Eventually, when you're ready to, you know, create the one unique rug, basically they bring those colors together, and that's the art. That's the the tradition they have for centuries. That many of these villages have been producing rugs for 500 years to a thousand years or even longer, and each family has this unique tradition of combining colors. Okay, what I think is fun, everybody, is the camera is actually having a hard time adjusting to all the colors that are there. We were just talking about, about this, that, you know, we, we have invested in, you know, not million dollar webcams, but decent webcams, because we're all webcamming a lot, but the webcams can hardly handle all of, let's see if I can screen in on this one. Yeah, I love that. When you start getting in, it's like, whoa, that's an overload of amazing color. And yet, as you said, you need, a Persian uses anywhere between 18 and 25 different colors. And sometimes the most darndest colors, the chartreuse, um, they're needed. Uh, the funky teal greens, they're needed to set off the other colors in the rug. And yet only an expert eye would really see that. So Yusuf, all right. I believe you were also going to show yes, us some of the tribals. Let's I can see. also put the, that file closer oh. so it's easier for camera to Easier process. for camera to process. process. All right. Hold on, folks. Young, young thing. Could you also? Thanks, sweetheart. So we're now taking you through the 9 by 12 tribals. Can you go just a little bit farther than that? Yeah. Tell me more about this one, because this is quite a bit different. Uh, so here we are looking at the tribal hands from wool natural dye kazakhs. So the kazakhs, you know, with their certain colors are pretty unique. Their designs, you have a tribal history, a region of a history of a region. Um, so when you look at a tribal rug, they tend to be a little more geometric design, mainly because how their structure is put together, how their knots are put together. So this is a Turkoman or Turkish knot. And that creates a more geometric, widespread out design, even when they're trying to create floral designs. And that's been true for about over 800 years. Here you have a Chobi natural dye rug that has all hand spun wool natural dyes. These rugs were almost diminishing in size because start artisans were having a hard time creating natural dyes. But thanks to fair trade, a lot of the natural dye process has come back. So now we're starting to see rugs with easily, you know, six, seven color, which is pretty hard to hard thing to do. So just know that fair trade is creating a lot, reviving the history that was uh, sort of dying away. Let's go down two more. And then I have a couple questions. Oh, oh this is an excellent one. All right. So how many of you look at this rug? and say, well, when that little boy over there, when he's older and when the dog is dead, yeah, that's when I am going to invest in an ivory colored rug. Is that, Nareth, do we have to wait until you are 18 to buy an no. ivory rug? Why not? Because it can clean up very easily. Yeah, and, and do you have any experience with cleaning things off of these rugs? Yes, but I don't want to talk about it right now. Well, who, what, maybe, Maybe name some things that you have cleaned up and talk in a loud voice. Spoon, spoon, and tea. Those are the three main things. Three main things. And what do you use? I just use a cloth. And some soap and water, yeah. right? All right. So, Yusuf, I believe you have some experience with this. A few times. And yeah. why don't I have you come over here? Yes. This is after dark. Our, our lighting is weird. Yes. So tell, tell me, uh, what experience have you had most recently with, well, uh, with yeah. poo and pee? Yeah. 
Our dog last couple weeks ago had a Sorry, Kara, situation. for you who are making dinner. Sorry, yeah. I didn't really mean to talk about poo and pee at this hour. So she had a situation and basically I ended up taking runner from our kitchen. Now is sitting and being, well, that I yesterday washed it with a hose and soap. And just on the side of our patio, it's drying. And unfortunately this morning, the first thing when I woke up was like, oh, it's raining. I thought I can grab that rug before the rain stops. So basically I rinsed that rug with just soap and water. I didn't even touch, do anything other than just rinsing and just let it dry for the day. But that was also because we had a major incident. Otherwise normal situations will be handled just with a paper towel and that's it. And can you do that with any bunyad, any and, rug anywhere or and, any bunyad rug? Why are you so bunyad. certain about a bunyad rug because being so durable? Bunyad rugs are done with high quality materials. When you have 100% uh, of the lanolin in the wool using the best quality material, artists need you know, them. When a rug is in the household, you don't have to worry about these basic things. So, you know, stains to sunlight to just about everything that kids and adults can dish out. These rugs are perfectly designed for that. So, like I mentioned earlier, that one customer just bought their 40 year old rug, two by three, that they have it at the entrance for the first time being cleaned. This is the rug that is sitting at their entrance. So, we actually took pictures, and it's a Bukhara rug, which is meant to be a geometric design. So, we were surprised to see how well that rug has handled. And only with a little effort of cleaning, that rug will look virtually brand new. Yusuf, it's not really fair that you're talking all about uh, cleaning. Uh, let us just pull in our director of stain resistancy. She couldn't be with us here tonight, uh, but we did pre record her, her statement. So, let me just get her here. All right, it's only fair. Hi, my name is Amanda, and uh, I am the Bunyad Director of Stain Resistancy. I work quite hard, and I never stop working. I do most of my work at home, but uh, I like to make certain that when my staff are on the floor and they talk about how durable a bunyan rug is, I want them to be able to have enough practical experiences that they can share. I specialize in liquids and solids and I have been quite productive in my work. Well, just the other day, they were saying, what did you do? And well, it left my people outside cleaning quite a few rugs. Here, let me show you. comical way of trying to show you truly this is this is what our life looks like um, and these stories do help us to help our customers know how durable they are I know if you talk with Joan Bailey is a fairly angelic uh, four-footer um, but I know he's had um, some instances and those instances truly allow us to speak from our heart of knowing if we drop red wine, you name it, uh, or doggy pee poo, soap and water is what you need. 
So I've kept it short, I've kept it sweet. I wanna actually just give you uh, a quick panoramic of our new location so that you can see the over 1500 rugs that we have here. Um, you can also, from the courtesy of your own um, lounge chair with your laptop, you can look at all of our rugs uh, at shop or at uh, bunyad.com or shop.bunyad.com, uh, B-U-N-Y-A-A-D. <gasps> Yusuf, get over here. What does bunyad stand for? I'm sorry, is that bunny yard? <laughs> bunyard, bunyard, it's bunyad. 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 And what, what does bunyad mean? Bunyad means foundation because we feel fair trade builds a strong foundations for communities in the villages. And we've seen it in, in action. We've seen it in a, you know, true examples where people are able to not only live in their villages, but also able to build their lives. They have better homes, their children are educated. And you'll see like within one generation, things change. And of course, in the end, there are people who are gonna become teachers and adapt other professions in life with education, but there are also people who choose to stay rug knotters. And one example is this couple of years, uh, last year, when I went to visit artisans, one woman that I particularly met with, she actually was a school teacher who decided to move back to the village, not only teach there in the village, but she said, I love making rugs. That was something has been a tradition in my family. And so she is making rugs, teaching girls in her, in her village, uh, giving them education and giving it back to the community. So people have that same mission in their mind, what they can, when they can give something back. And that's why fair trade is so important. And Bunyad is then one of the names that is representing that mission, that is creating a strong foundation for those communities and building a better communities in the villages. And what we really like to point out, um, especially I think over this last year, we've all learned how important it is to have a strong community around us, be it if we're a small business, be it if we're an individual that's running out of toilet paper. Um, you know, I think what the last year has taught many North Americans that I think much of the rest of the world knows is that your strength is in your community that surrounds you, your strength is in uh, your friends and, and family. And for us, our strength of being able to keep 850 families gainfully employed throughout 100 villages in Pakistan is because of all of you, because of all of the fair trade stores hosting fair trade rug events, telling their folks that love fair trade that are telling their friends, it might not be the time for you to buy a rug right now. That's okay. Although just to point out, we do have those little coasters that 1595, they're like perfect for every budget, but you know, so I digress. Um, but just telling folks, spreading the word, being able to amplify the voice of Just Creations or of your other fair trade uh, entities around you. I don't know if you're all joining us from Louisville or, or not, but to amplify, share the posts, tell your friends, it makes a huge difference. It's been a challenging year. We, Certainly can say it's not the COVID pivot. We've done the COVID pirouette, um, mm -hmm. but our artisans have done the same thing and have found ways uh, to, to continue working with us and continue uh, staying gainfully employed. So for all of you who are helping to pull together uh, the rug event in Just Creations, um, April 7th through 10th, thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to being there. Uh, we're looking forward to bringing many of these, these items with you. Again, if you want to pre-shop, go to shop.bunyad.com and you can even say, ooh, I like this, and ooh, that's gorgeous. And we can try to get those things onto the truck because I have to say, we're looking forward to working off some of our COVID pudge by um, loading a truck filled with roughly around 300, 350 pieces. So let me just give you a quick uh, 360 uh, so that you can sort of see everything that we have from our tiny little two by threes all the way up to our 10 by 14. And then I think we are almost perfectly on time for our schedule and we can open it up for any questions that you might have or uh, uh, do you take requests for going out to people's houses to clean their rugs or do you cook? Okay, well, we'll come back to that. All right, let me just give you a quick 360 of uh, the store. All right, so you saw 
Oops, hold on. I tightened everything because I didn't want you to see in the ceiling. All right, so start over here. Nareis, you want to wave? There you go. There's Nareis. That's our front desk. All right, so we are in a building now that was built in 1860. We're located in downtown Lidditz, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour uh, west of Philadelphia. Uh, this is one of the original homes in the downtown Lidditz area. And it used to be an old bank. Before that, it was a hardware store. Before that, it was another hardware store. So you can see all the different types of rugs from our Chobies, our natural dyes, our Persians. And I'm gonna have to duck the time here. We are tickled to have this many uh, walls. Hold on a sec. And take it around. And yes, I think we have found a way to basically put rugs on every area imaginable. And there you can see our high tech setup. Everybody wave to yourselves. There you are. All right. So that is the quick. Quick one, two, three of Bunyad. Yusuf, why don't you and I stand over here? Yeah. We'll change the camera. And uh, there. 704. I want you all to know the one thing we don't necessarily do is we normally don't make our conversation short and sweet because, quite honestly, we're quite passionate about what we do. Uh, it's exciting to see lives change. It's exciting to see customers' lives change by coming in and realizing how something as simple as just choosing a fair trade product, be it a rug or anything else, how many lives can be touched and changed by that. Um, so we're really quite excited. So the idea that we got done before time, we're excited. So folks, what questions do you have? Uh, you know, do you have a dog that you'd like to talk about? Do you have uh, a rug in your house? What happens if she drops some of those turnips and purple cabbage? Turmeric though, I guess I have to say turmeric has to be one of the worst things. Mm -hmm. How would you get turmeric out of a rug? Well, just soap and water. How did you get turmeric out of a rug? Not well, soap and water. <laughs> soap and water. Just, yeah, it just comes right out because the lanolin doesn't allow anything to penetrate. So it's a pretty easy to- but that one time we dropped the whole bottle, you did use some bleach. Yeah, that was like, that's only a rare incident, but generally water, soap and water takes care of everything. What other questions? I'm going to take us off of spotlight there, that way. There we are, um, now I see you all. I'll ask a question. Yeah. How many different styles of rugs do you have there and how many will be coming to us in April? So roughly, and, and, so go ahead. You know, I just, and maybe just explain the difference between some of the more popular ones maybe, because I know it's a really long list, but I think it's very interesting. So within the, 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 the main list of rugs from Persian to tribal, we have roughly have about 12 to 13 different type of rugs. But then the sub categories extend up to 54 different type of rugs, just because within that whole range of styles and artisan create so many different things uh, from kilns to, these are hand spun wool natural dye kilns. And now they've done from kilns to pillows and other things as well. Then you have the high knot count versions that range from 500 to 800 knots per square inch to, you know, up to 1200 knots per square inch. So for example, this is one of the pillows that you'll see. We have a few different designs and styles, but this is like indigo color that you're looking at, natural dye straight from the, from the plant. So the whole idea that artisans do just about many amazing things. Like here is a tapestry coming in, chain stitch tapestry. So there's a, such a variety of rugs that artisans get to create. So there is a, uh, from you know they're your traditional Persians, for example, one on the wall, and yet you have the Chobi natural dye right here with the purples and with other colors. So that's a pretty unique thing. So there will be quite a variety from starting with a very small rugs like little coasters. So about 350 rugs, roughly. That's the general number that we have. So when we're looking at coasters, we're talking pieces like this. You know, I had a customer today who said. Oh, I took one and now I realize what it means when you have a coaster like this, 
not only it makes it look beautiful, it's very practical because these things stay on the surface. So you never have to take them off. Whereas all other coasters, sort of you got to put them away and yet you don't have to tell anybody, you know, hey, you got a coaster to put rug on, uh, the, your drink on. So everything that artisans make are very, very practical products. And so roughly about 350 different rugs from net from your uh, six foot runners all the way to 12, 13 foot long runners to anywhere from two by three to 10, 12, 10 by 14 size rugs will be coming in to your uh, direction. And one person came in the other day and I love the idea. I'm not a terribly, um, I'm not big on a lot of the voice activated things uh, like Google Assist. <laughs> I have a 10 year old. I don't need anyone, any other device talking to me. Um, but they said they bought a little mug rug to go under their Google Assist to make it look less techy, and I thought oh, that's a that's a really cute idea. Yes. But hey, the other thing, Yusuf, is you don't we don't ask for them to make a decision. Any of our customers to make decisions mm. on the spot. Nope. You can take rugs home and try it and see how it looks in your house. Take a couple of them or more than a couple to make sure that you're happy because we want to make sure that when you you know take a rug home, the rug feels like. This is the rug you want for the rest of your life because it's going to be rug that you would, the last thing you will have to replace in your house. And the only thing we're not responsible for? That you may end up with more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That you might find that you're shopping for more yeah. than the space that you thought. What other questions do you have? Any other questions? Wow. We stymied them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I want to know how Kara's dinner is coming. Do you have a recommended uh, frequency? Oh, very that? nice. That looks lovely. Thank you. Uh, do you have a recommended frequency of like just normal mm -hmm. upkeep of care and washing and, you know, just, just for that case scenario? So normal cleaning or caring for the rug is just vacuuming your rug when you clean your house. That's pretty much what rugs are. And then major cleaning is not needed if you properly vacuum it once a week, every other week. Um, that won't be needed for the next 20 to 25 years. That's generally the time frame we see. We've seen older rugs than that, and we've seen some rugs that came early to us for some cleaning. And so it's a personal, but generally 25 to 30 years is a fairly normal number of years before rug needs a major cleaning. So you're good for a while, everybody. <laughs> how do you recommend that um, if someone is new to buying a rug like this, how do you recommend that they go about choosing something, not just in their own personal style, but something that fits and has some um, flexibility with however their lives may change for the 40 years that they will have this rug so the 40 years of furniture that they may have we often tell folks that choosing a rug is sort of like choosing a partner um you don't you might go in uh with an idea of what you think you like um but then when you start looking around or you start in essence flipping through the piles different things start to speak to you. And we see that over and over again with customers where they're like, okay, let's just get a rough idea of what size you're looking for and for what room. Today and then we- was a prime example. Right, where we started going through the pile, they came in with a, a notion of what they thought would be perfect for their space. But as they kept flipping through the piles, they found themselves being drawn to a certain feel or a certain look. And then, that's where then they sort of got directed into going, okay, if I like this, what else could I maybe like, let me try this one, this one, and this one. They took several home and they laid them down and went, oh, wow, at least two or three of these will work. I'm going to go with this one. Um, when you come in, let's say to get ready for a, um, at a rug event, come in with your measurements of your room, rough idea of what you hope to fill. Um, and then uh, maybe some paint samples or uh, fabric swatches or something. But again, to be able to take rugs home, it's huge. Like you can see now, we're trying to adjust the crazy light that's in here. We have spotlights, we have natural light coming in. All of you have the same thing in your own home and it's different 
um, than, than what we have in the showroom. I wouldn't say that there's one rug that's better, like, hello, I have four boys who all wear cleats. Uh, I think you should get, no, all these rugs will be equally as durable. Um, it's truly about personal preference. So for example, today, this, this uh, email just came back to us, customer who bought this rug. This is a Gabe rug. And when they came in looking for a rug, they were looking at very light color rugs. And the funny thing is they went with a rug that absolutely fit their house, their room. It's much darker, actually a black background. So rug finds you when you see the rugs. When you go through the pile, that's where we make sure that you get to see every rug. And once you see a rug, it clicks because these are rugs created by artisans in their homes. So another human choice is fits another person's choice here in North America. So what you're saying is you're running like a fair trade dating circle for customers <laughs> in carpet? Yeah, pretty much that's what it is. In, in essence. Um, in terms of padding, padding isn't really necessary under any of these rugs. If you have a rug that's someplace like in a high traffic area that you think it's going to slip around, yes, then get something like an anti-skid. But under all of our rugs at home, we don't have any padding. Um, padding is truly a North American invention that is trying to get those of us that have been in, uh, used to wall-to-wall -wall carpet with that extra um, cushion sort of to help break us into having less of a cushion, but it is not needed for the longevity of a carpet. Hello, Lewis. Now it is. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, Sorry, I'm here. Now, yeah, see the right 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 right. Very nice to see you. Nice to see you. I love this sessions. I really do. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love Zoom. I, I have to say, like, just what we're learning, like, what we see of all of you here is so much more real than when you just come into the store. And I never would have known that Beth and I actually have the same color. I don't know, Beth, if you're in your dining room or not. Uh, that's the same color as our dining room. So, like, this is sort of helpful knowing, huh? When Beth comes in, we need to look at <laughs> um, what are your thickest types of rugs um, for my very cold floors. Um, all of our rugs are, are, are nicely thick. Now, sometimes you will see customers that come in and say, I have a super thick rug. And what they're actually saying is they have a rug that's not terribly high not count and probably is not a terribly good wool, but they made it this really big, thick pile, so it feels full. All of ours are incredibly dense, either by knot count, like thin wool, high knot count, or a slightly chunkier hand spun wool, but densely packed. So, so all of them, Melissa, are going to be great for a cold floor. All of them, I promise you. I We have we in have our kitchen, room. yeah, kitchen. in a sunroom and kitchen, our house was built in 1896. Um, sunroom sun is insulated, I think, back in 19, 1896. Um, <laughs> so it's cold and it has a ceramic floor. We have a Kanmandi tribal, a Baluchi tribal, yeah. and a Kazakh. These are all small, on. yeah, small four mm -hmm. by six pieces. So we like to have different styles also, and yet they all work wonderfully. And Without those rugs, those floors will be very cold. Actually, do you remember when we first moved in? Yeah. yeah. When we first moved into our house, we were slow. <laughs> Imagine that. It took us 10 years to get married. So, you know, we're slow <laughs> in a lot of things. Um, but when we moved into our new house, it took us about six months because we were out on the road doing various rug events, trying to move in between rug events. It really was not conducive. And so we finally moved over and said, okay, we'll leave everything there. We'll take a couple pieces of furniture. That's great. Our new house was so cold. And we thought, oh my gosh, what did we just get into? Is it something with the windows? Is it something with the heating system? And then we moved the rugs over. And instantaneously, because I even looked at Yusuf and said, is it because we sell rugs that we're saying this? He's like, no, it just helped to warm up and really hold the heat that was coming out. And what the lanolin warms up and then contains the heat down where typically heat rises, but the lanolin warms up and keeps the heat down. 
same thing applies for the summer. So with air conditioning, the, the lanolin will cool down and keep the coolness down. So you, your rooms actually saves energy. So not only they're very practical, they're very, very energy saving uh, uh, tools for the house. Hmm. Where we are here in Lidditz, um, we have a lot of customers that, Lancaster County is a huge um, center for retirement homes. And it's been fun because we have one that's quite close to the store. And customers have been coming in who have been our customers for the last 20, 30 years. And now they're moving into retirement um, apartments. And it's been really great to hear them saying, oh, no, no, I didn't have to get ready of any of my carpets. They moved with me. And I mm -hmm. think that's such a huge plus for hand knotted carpets where you make the investment. The investment moves with you. And the investment is something that you pass down. Well, and the best part is like, I actually went to drop one of the, one of the couple of rugs uh, that customers moved with. And it was surprising how quickly the, the, the room warmed up. And for them, it was like the house, the new place felt like house, home that they've lived in for many, for many decades. So rug will, you know, take the memories with you. I have a question. Yes, Beth. So if I see a couple of rugs on the website, then would that mean that you would bring them to Louisville or? A yeah. Great question. So what you can do is go onto the website and search and put things into your cart and then say, submit the cart and say, I'd like these brought to Louisville. We will communicate with you most of most everything on the website is here. Rajee's Law will be like several of the carpets that you want will be at maybe some of our other locations. But seriously, the majority of what is on the website here, it here is in, uh, in Lidditz. So yes, go onto the website pre-shop uh, and uh, we'll be happy to get those loaded in. Okay, thanks. You're very welcome. We're looking forward to being on the road and back to Louisville because mm -hmm. I've enjoyed every trip in that area and every, all of our other staff members, we usually have a people who are like, no, I wanna go, I wanna go. So, <laughs> and it's a joy to be returning to places like uh, Louisville. Well, you have an amazing fair trade store there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you are one lucky community to have folks that are uh, so dedicated to having a fully fair trade store and making certain that their customers know the stories and the vision behind every single product uh, that is in the store. Uh, you, they also have an amazing pool of volunteers. And I think that's really combined with great management makes that store sing. So we love going there and uh, wish it was a little more open so that we, we've even been known to bring the entire family uh, sadly, I don't think that's going to happen uh, this year, but hopefully uh, coming up in the coming years, we will, we will all be back. You know, I would also like to do one more plug. I, I love this. I, I just can't like tell you, here you all are in Little. Like your faces are all here at our, our front desk. Um, one of the things that we've done over the past year is trying to continue to create this community because we all know that that's where the strengths of, of our areas are. Um, so we do a cooking with Bunyad the second Sunday of every single month, where it is an online cooking show, um, cooking show, cooking party, cooking hilarity, one yeah, or, yeah. pick a word, cooking gathering. Cooking gathering. Uh, this last, uh, we do one recipe where you sign up, it's free, and it's a time where we weave our love of cooking and Pakistani culture uh, and traditions into, into cooking with you. Uh, this last month, we deviated from Pakistan a little bit and went to Brazil to make some caldo queijo, but we are just about to reveal um, April's recipe. We are heading back to Pakistan and are pretty excited about our Pakistani recipe. So that's going to be the second Sunday. It will be right after Louisville rug event. So you'll be so pumped up and excited about uh, rugs and about Pakistan that you're going to want to cook with us. So it's April 11th at 4 p.m. Eastern, and you can sign up on the Bunyad Facebook page as soon as we do the recipe reveal. 
And these are these are the foods that artisans uh, on a daily basis eat. And so the goal is to introduce you to you know their life, what people do, how people live, and how many commonalities we have with each other. Just because somebody's living thousands of miles away, they're still eating the bread, and they're still eating the same grains and same foods. Love for the vegetables, love for the nature, and everything is the same. Mm. Um, do you guys have any cautionary tales when it comes to buying your first rug or, you know, I know that you guys are probably very open to where people want to put their rugs, but is there, has there ever been a time or a place that somebody wanted to put or use a rug for something that you thought? <sighs> <laughs> so, so, uh, oh, so let me answer that one. So, so we will happily help you find a rug for any place that a customer feels is important. That has meant uh, the interior of a car, a boat hallway, an RV, and my personal favorite in the bottom of a dog cage. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, cautionary tale. I mean, there is no place that a rug can't, can't go. Bathrooms, kitchens, entryways. We don't recommend them being outside. Um, or in the garage. Oh yeah, we had one That's in the, the garage, mm. um, but we recommend them not being outside. Although we had someone in Perth, yeah. Perth, yeah. Ontario, who had a, uh, a enclosed gazebo. gazebo porch. And so she bought a kiln to put out there. We told her it probably won't last as long as you it would if you had it inside. She goes, ah, that's not a problem. Um, uh, any other cautionary tales is if, um, if you and the other person who needs to make the decisions in your house see eye to eye, um, definitely come together. If you don't, perhaps one of you coming, scoping it out, and then the two of you coming um, is maybe the best route to go. Um, Yusuf and I usually in the end see eye to eye. Uh, however, we did walk up the aisle to potato, potato, let's call the whole thing off. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we usually, here we are 18 years, here we are 18 years later, um, but, you know, we usually do see in the end, but it's funny how we both react when we're flipping through where I'm like, oh, I love that. And he's like, well, that's great, but you know, that's uh, way too big for our room. And I'm like, no, it isn't. I know we can fit it. And, you know, so I think sometimes to re realize that when you come in shopping with another person, you get to see another side of them. Uh, and a side that I'll never forget the man who came in and he's like, yeah, well, I don't want anything pink. And we're like, oh, all right, whatever. <laughs> and so we're flipping through, we're flipping through and he gets to this one. Mm -hmm. In my mind, it was screaming pink. And we just, you know, we put it on the floor and we said to him uh, later, like, wow, I'm so glad you, you found yourself really liking this. I must ask you though, what part of this do you not see pink? He's like, pink? That's not pink. That's raspberry cream. <laughs> oh, okay. Raspberry cream it is. You know, so to realize that when you begin to interact with a certain rug and it grabs you, you find yourself adjusting what you thought you liked. And it happens a lot with the rugs. Yeah. People always like the customer I, we worked with uh, today and the other day, they basically said they need something very light because their walls and this and that. And then the rug they picked was actually the darkest rug and yet it looks beautiful. And we always tell customer, the rug will also find you. It's a piece of art. You, your eyes will be caught to it. You know, your eyes will tell you, this is the rug I really want to walk away, uh, take it home and live with it for, for the rest of my life. So rugs being a piece of art they pretty much tell the story and speak to the to the idea of what fair trade means when someone art, an artisan can put their heart and soul into each rug and the rug really lasts a lifetime what's the best way to hang a small rug melissa i love that you have all these yeah. great questions Great way to hang a small rug. There's a couple of different ways. So let's just uh, take you behind me. So what we have here, um, we have actually just taken a um, one by four 
put a little grout in the back and then have the rug clip hanging over. That's uh, a more long-term permanent way. And for someone who has woodworking skills, if you have no woodworking skills like me, uh, grab some finishing nails, nail it in every six to eight inches, maybe what, 10 inches uh, and nail it across. You're not gonna hurt the rug. You're gonna make a couple holes in your walls, but that's it. Um, final way would be, you know, the carpet tacking that they use for wall-to-wall um, uh, -wall carpet. You can get a strip of carpet tacking, put it to your wall, and then hang the rug up on the carpet tacking. What's nice, it has all those little grippers that are coming out, mm -hmm. and then the rug clips on. The only problem with that is that if, you, if it's someplace where it's going to hang and just be, it's wonderful. If it is around a family that's constantly moving and touching it, I would go the nail into the wall route. Well, but also there's rug clips that are very easily available. Now you can I buy that. Yeah, so the rug clips or even the dowel, for example, using a fishing wire, using a dowel, and just the, you know, every 10 inches or six inches, uh, just wrapping it up, that will be a way to go to, which is easier as well. Hammering it into the wall is easy. Yeah. I'm just saying, hammer, nail. It depends how, you know, how fancy you want to see it. No, that's true. <laughs> we have the rug that we got married on top of actually just um over our banister on our second floor um we've always talked about hanging it and then got yeah. to the banister and it just looks so gosh darn good there and it allows us to still touch it and move it and we do family photos on it so yeah this has been awesome guys well, um, uh, we've we've come up to an hour we've come up to our hour perfect timing um <laughs> Uh, and, unless anybody has any any dire questions that they need to ask now, uh, Yusuf, you will be here for the rug event, will you not? Yeah, well, We're working out those details. Okay. We are working well, out details. One of our amazing, incredibly knowledgeable folks will be there. So if you have more questions, come to the rug event and who, whoever is uh, here will be glad to answer them. Uh, thank you. Jenny Yusuf, we we certainly appreciate your presence here. You you've 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 done yourselves well. Yeah, um, you. So thank just a, just a plug for next time uh, coming in April. Uh, our title for the Fair Trade Explorers is going to be Who Made Your Clothes. Um, so you can get to learn about uh, you know where your, where where clothes are coming from and maybe how to make better decisions when you buy them. Uh, so thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Uh, see you guys Bye. soon again. Bye. Bye.